Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to this uh, webinar collaboration of the International Council on Clean Transportation and Consumer Reports on the topic of electric vehicles, a win-win for consumers and the climate. I'm Joe Schultz, Director of Communications for the ICCT, and in a moment I'll introduce the first of our two presenters. First, a few brief housekeeping details. Uh, everyone has their microphones on mute. If you have questions during the presentation, as we hope you will do, please write them in the questions box at the con uh, in the control panel at the right of your screen. And we will be compiling those for the Q&A segment that will follow the two presentations. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. We'll send out a link to the recording early next week. And the presentations will also be posted online for those who are interested, likely by the end of the day today. <clears throat> So with that, let me turn this uh, immediately over to the first of our presenters. Uh, Chris Harto is a senior sustainability policy analyst at Consumer Reports. Uh, he performs research and analysis on a wide range of sustainability and transportation topics to help Consumer Reports advocate for a more sustainable and just marketplace. And he will be uh, the first presenter today talking about research that uh, Consumer Reports has recently done. So. With no further ado, Chris, I'll turn it to you. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about how electric vehicles are delivering the savings that consumers want. So, next slide. Um, a little bit on Consumer Reports. Uh, we are a nonprofit uh, member organization that represents over 6 million consumers. We're probably best known for our testing and rating of products, uh, especially cars. Uh, so on the photo to the right, you can see our auto test center in Connecticut, where we buy and test dozens of cars every year and put them through over 50 independent tests uh, to, to rate them. Uh, but we also do a lot of survey and, and other research, and we also advocate for policies that protect consumers. Next slide. Today I'm going to be talking about, uh, the, what I'm going to be talking about, most of these results come from two reports. One is our electric most recent electric vehicle survey uh, from 2020, and also an EV ownership cost report that we put out last year. Next slide. Uh, so to start off with, I just wanted to, to set the table with a few uh, key definitions. Things can get a little confusing uh, when when talking about electric vehicles. So when we talk about electric vehicles, we're really talking about two types of vehicles. Um, one is is battery electric vehicles. These are vehicles that uh, run only on electricity. Uh, they have a, a battery and a plug. You plug in the vehicle, and electricity is the only type of energy that this vehicle can use. Uh, there's another type of electric vehicle called a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. And these vehicles have a battery and a plug and can travel for a certain number of miles on battery, on electricity only, uh, typically some, in somewhere between 25 and 50 miles on electricity. But then they also have an engine and a gas tank and uh, they they can go even further on on gasoline uh, so those are plug-in electric vehicles uh, so bevs and phevs uh, make up what we consider electric vehicles uh, there's another category of hybrid vehicles uh, this is your uh, toyota prius these vehicles also have a battery but they don't have a plug uh, so they only run on gasoline the the electric uh, components make the vehicle more efficient but it is not an electric vehicle, but sometimes you'll hear automakers or the media talk about electrified vehicles. So when they talk about electrified vehicles, they are including uh, hybrid vehicles in that category. Uh, but for our, our purposes, we're only going to be talking about electric vehicles. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about consumer interest in electric vehicles. Uh, next slide. Consumer Reports has done a lot of survey research around electric vehicles, and we find that uh, consumer interest in, in buying an electric vehicle is actually quite high. 
Um, in our most recent survey, we found that over 30% of Americans were interested in at least considering an EV for their next vehicle, and over 70% of Americans were interested in buying one, owning one down the road. Uh, but when we dug deeper into those numbers, we also found some trends that, that are really positive towards potential growing interest in EVs. Uh, one is generational. We found that millennials were 50%, had 50% greater interest in EVs than baby boomers. And this is important because as baby boomers age and as, as millennials age, uh, millennials are making up a larger portion of the car buying public while baby boomers are, are reducing the number of cars that they buy as they enter retirement. Another trend we found is that interest among people who had direct experience with EVs was much higher than from people who don't have much direct experience with EVs. We actually found that among consumers who had, who knew somebody who had an EV and had driven an EV, uh, among those people, their interest in buying an EV for their next vehicle was three times as like large as someone who did not have any direct experience with EVs. Um, and actually among those, those group, that group of people who knew somebody and who, who had driven an EV, 26% of them said they definitely plan to buy an EV for their next vehicle. So that's a, very, that's a big, big jump uh, from the 4% overall. Also, we find that when consumers buy an EV, they're happy with their purchase. Every year, Consumer Reports puts out their owner satisfaction ratings for cars, and this is based on a very large survey we send out to our members. Uh, from this survey, we find that 93% of the EVs that Consumer Reports has tested received an above average owner satisfaction rating, which means 93% of EVs are in the top half of, of owner satisfaction, which is really great. And, and actually the number one vehicle in owner satisfaction is also an EV, the Tesla Model 3. Oh, sorry, next, next slide. Um, leave this here for a second. Um, and then next slide again. We also find that the market is rapidly expanding. Within the past year, there's been an explosion of choice within the market for consumers with a large number of electric crossovers, SUVs, and even pickup trucks hitting the market either within the past year or coming to market within the next six months or so, uh, including vehicles like the Rivian pickup truck, the, the Ford F-150 Lightning expected early next year, um, the Volkswagen ID4. All of these vehicles hit the sweet spot of the types of vehicles consumers want. And that greater choice is leading to much greater sales of EVs. Uh, EV sales have more than doubled this year, despite all of the supply chain problems you may have heard in the media about the auto industry. Um, and, and this strong demand is catching automakers by surprise. Um, many, many automakers are increasing their EV plans, rapidly expanding their production capacity, to keep up with consumer demand that is just far exceeding what automakers expected in this segment. Uh, as an example, Ford recently announced that they are doubling their produ production plan for 2023, EV production plan for 2023, and expect the, the EVs to make up 10% of all the vehicles they build in just two years, uh, which is a huge shift from a, from a company that didn't even have an EV on the market a little over a year ago. So shifting from consumer demand to consumer benefits, um, next, next slide and next slide. Uh, consumer Reports did a detailed analysis of EV ownership costs recently. And in this analysis, we took the top sell, compared the top selling EVs with the best selling and highest rated vehicles in their class. Uh, we wanted those comparisons because we wanted to test 
see how the EVs stacked up against the best gasoline vehicles that were available. Um, and, and what we found is that from, from a cost perspective, uh, EVs come out on top, even, even when, when stacked against some of the best, uh, best vehicles in their class. Uh, in that analysis, we factored in purchase price, resale value, repair and maintenance, and fuel cost. Um, next slide. So when we looked at resale value, this, this is a question that comes up a lot about EVs. And um, there's, there's some misconceptions out there and, and actually some data based on early EVs that EVs just don't hold their value as, as well as, as gasoline vehicles. And, and while that is true about some of the early EVs that hit the market that had very low range, like uh, early Nissan Leafs that, that had about 80 miles of range, and those vehicles haven't held their value very well. However, when we looked at the current crop of the EVs, um, EVs that come with more than 200 miles of range, between 200 and 300 miles of range, and we looked at industry data on those vehicles, we found that those newer vehicles, the vehicles that are on the market today, uh, actually do hold their, are expected to hold their value just as well as gasoline vehicles. Next, next slide. Uh, next, we looked at repair and maintenance. Um, Consumer Reports also does, uh, is known for our reliability ratings. And every year we do a huge annual survey in which uh, we get data on hundreds of thousands of vehicles owned by consumers. And consumers tell us what they are paying, what's going wrong with their vehicles and what they are paying for maintenance. Uh, when we looked at this data, we found that for EVs, uh, the repair and maintenance costs are half of what they are for a gasoline vehicle. Um, and when you add up those, those savings, we found that the average consumer will save about $4,600 over the life of their vehicle in reduced uh, repair and maintenance costs. Uh, it's also about $450 a year in, in savings uh, from, from not going to the repair shop. For I'm owning an EV. Next slide. Uh, next, we have fuel costs. So we we all then looked at fuel costs. Um, fuel we comparing you know fueling up with gasoline versus plug uh, plugging in your vehicle, um, and we find that uh, EVs in in popular classes uh, range from about $800 a year savings for a car up to $1,300 a year. In fuel savings uh, from owning a pickup truck, and and these are with gas prices before gas prices spiked this year. So um, people who own an EV today are saving even more. Uh, overall, it's, it was about 60% savings on average across the country from fuel savings. Next slide. So when you add this all up. Um, uh, for for popular EVs versus popular and and well-rated gasoline vehicles, we find that typical typical savings for buying an EV over the lifetime of that car come to about six thousand to ten thousand dollars. And we have some examples here. Um, if you buy a Nissan Leaf instead of a Hyundai, Hyundai Elantra, you'd save seven thousand dollars over the life of that vehicle. If you buy a Mustang Mach-E instead of a Mazda CX-5, you can expect to save about $6,000. Uh, for Buy a Ford Escape plug-in hybrid instead of a RAV4, you can expect to save about $10,000. And we have a bunch more examples in, in our report that you can find and look at after the presentation. Next slide. And then what, one other point we wanted to, to highlight here is that Consumers who buy a used EV can expect to save even more. Uh, when, when we looked at uh, purchase, purchasing when somebody purchased a vehicle, uh, the savings can, can more than double for, for an old, buying an older used EV. And why that happens is because while EVs are more expensive to buy, 
those uh, those savings on gas and maintenance uh, continue to rack up over time, and you know, the a lot of the purchase price uh, after five years, less than 50% of an, a new a vehicle cost about 50% less than buying new. So you're you're paying less upfront, but you're getting all of the same savings. So EVs are as as they start moving in more and more into the used market are just going to become an even greater value for consumers. Next slide. Uh, and just a quick note on policy support. Next slide. Um, while consumers are doing a lot to drive uh, the EV market and, and, and drive change in the transportation sector, we still need policy support to ensure equity and accessibility to this market. Um, some some legislation on the Hill recently passed the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which has a lot of funding uh, for EV infrastructure and, and charging. Uh, the Build Back Better Act has has tax credits that will help make EVs more in, affordable, including a used EV tax credit that will can help lower income Americans, uh, lower and middle income Americans access used EVs even better. And, and, and regulations are important as well that help drive innovation in the marketplace and innovation from automakers. Uh, next slide. And, in, and next slide. And in conclusion, we find that strong consumer interest plus consumer, a strong consumer value proposition plus strong policy support are really driving a transportation revolution. Uh, that is going to lead to really important uh, benefits for the climate, as as Georg will go into next. Thank you, Chris, uh, for a very interesting presentation on market trends and consumer interests and industry trends. So I'm sure there will be some good questions following out of that at the end of the at the end of the session here. Um, <clears throat> Our next presenter, Georg Beeker, is a researcher based in ICCT's Europe office. Uh, his current work focuses on the life cycle, climate and environment, environmental impacts of passenger vehicles, including the fuel and electricity consumption of plug-in hybrids and battery electric vehicles and real world usage. He also has a background in battery chemistry and so he plays a key role in ICCT's research work in the area of battery technologies. But his presentation today will be, as you can see on the uh, work that he recently completed on uh, a comprehensive life, life cycle analysis of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in passenger vehicles and focusing in this case primarily on the U.S. So, Georg. Yeah, thank you very much, Joe, and thank you for the uh, presentation, Chris. That was very interesting. Um, yeah, so um, I want to um, show some slides on um, our recent analysis on the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of battery electric better electric vehicles in comparison to uh, conventional um, combustion engine cars. Uh, next slide, please. And yeah, I want to start with this figure here. Um, the, the, the point is that um, the uh, if you want to reduce or if you want to um, keep global warming at the at, um, at level of 1.5 degrees C, as foreseen by the Paris Agreement, uh, we would need to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from global road transport by 80 per 80 percent by 2050 so that that's really massive um, and uh, we did the study now in order to understand uh, which technologies can deliver such reduction for passenger cars um, on, on a life cycle basis so uh, yeah next slide please uh, life cycle here means um, that we do not only look at the vehicle usage phase, so at the tailpipe CO2 emissions that are zero for electric vehicles, but we also look at the emissions that correspond to the fuel and electricity production, and both together um, correspond to the fuel cycle or the well-to-wheel um, cycle. Um, and in addition, we looked at the vehicle cycle, which corresponds to the Crandall to grave emissions, so uh, including also the emissions of the battery and the vehicle production as well as the recycling at the end of life and we looked at um, yeah the three main greenhouse gases 
which, which are CO2, but also methane and nitrous oxide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, I want to show only one slide on the methodology because this is a very important point I want to highlight. And this is also something that differs from earlier studies. Um, in this study, we looked at the development of the fuel electricity mix during the lifetime of the vehicle. So we did not only uh, yeah, use the current carbon intensity of electricity, but we covered how the um, average electricity mix will develop in future. And, and for sure, it's, it's difficult to predict the future. And therefore, we used a best case and the worst case scenario. Um, the worst case scenario would be that um, we only see the effect of um, the um, policies that are already in place. And the, the best case scenario would be that we will see additional policies that results in the development of the electricity mix that allows to uh, yeah, hold the, the uh, the, the Paris Agreement and uh, limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C. And you can see here on the right uh, what, what this means um, then for the carbon intensity of the electricity mix. So in, in that study um, we published in, in summer, we did not only look at the US, we also looked at Europe and at China and also at India. And you can see for all these four regions um, the development of the carbon intensity of the average electricity mix. And what is highlighted here is the mix uh, for uh, the US, so with this red and green um, highlighting. Um, and you can see the, how, what, what difference it makes uh, when we consider just the average electricity mix in a conservative uh, worst case scenario or in an optimistic uh, Paris aligned scenario. Next slide, please. Yeah, and with this, I want to jump into the results directly. So, on this slide, you see the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions from the different powertrain types we analyzed in the, in the US, which are gasoline cars, including also uh, hybrid uh, electric vehicles. So the Toyota Prius that was mentioned in the presentation before, um, hybrid electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles, and fuel cell electric vehicles. And for battery electric vehicles, we consider the battery electric vehicles powered by the average electricity mix and battery electric vehicles powered solely by renewable electricity. And for hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles, we, we did more or less the same. So here we consider the um, fuel cell electric vehicles powered only by natural gas based hydrogen, which is the dominant um, source of hydrogen right now. And 100% um, renewable electricity based hydrogen, which is um, the idea um, to um, yeah, be the hydrogen of the future and the um, yeah, the, the more sustainable kind of hydrogen, which is supported by, 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 by policy. And you can see the different contributions to these life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see that in gray on, on the very bottom, the um, production of the vehicle itself um, is, very, is relatively similar um, for all powertrain types. In yellow, you can see the additional emissions that correspond to the production of the battery. Uh, and you can see that these make up about 30% uh, or one third of the total production emissions of battery electric vehicles. But you can also see that for fuel cell electric vehicles, there's a certain contribution of producing the hydrogen tank. So also that hydrogen tank in fuel cell electric vehicles corresponds to relatively um, high um, emissions. Uh, yeah, and then you can see in dark blue, the emissions that occur directly in the vehicle. Uh, so the tailpipe emissions, and then in lighter blue, the emissions from the fuel and from the electricity production. And here you can see that also for gasoline cars, um, there are some upstream emissions. There are some emissions that correspond to the um, sourcing of, of petroleum, to the um, processing of it, to the transport. Um, and also for um, ethanol, um, corn-based ethanol, for instance, you have some production emissions that need to be considered in a life cycle assessment. And the results are uh, yeah, pretty clear. We see that hybrid electric vehicles offer a reduction of 42 to 45 percent compared to today's gasoline cars, uh, whereas battery electric vehicles show 
a reduction, reduction of 60 to 68 percent. Um, this range again corresponds to the worst case and the best case scenario of the development of the electricity mix. And you can see that for fuel cell electric vehicles, it really varies with the kind of hydrogen that is used. So for hydrogen that is produced from natural gas, um, the greenhouse gas emission benefit is not that high, but for um, hydrogen that is produced from renewable electricity, we can see also a large uh, greenhouse gas emission benefit compared to gas and gas. Next slide. And here you can see how we estimate um, this to develop in, in the future. So um, what we expect, uh, how it would look like for cars that will be registered in, in 10 years from now in 2030. So we, we would assume that um, average gasoline cars would have 10% lower emissions than today due to improvements in the fuel economy. Um, but for battery electric vehicles, due to the uh, continuous improvement of the electric grid, uh, we can see that the benefit increases uh, to 66 to 78 percent. And here you see this is really a large range um, because we go um, further in the future. Uh, we, it's getting more and more uncertain um, how it will um, evolve, but still 66 to 78 percent is really a massive uh, reduction that, that we will see here. Next slide, please. Yeah, and here's an overview of the results we also have for the other regions. And um, there are in general two trends that can be seen. First is that in all four regions, we see that for cars registered in 2021, which are on the left in, in each of the uh, four regions, uh, we can see that battery electric vehicles show a significant greenhouse gas emission benefit over uh, average gasoline cars also in India and also in China, uh, which is mainly due to the improvement that is foreseen in, in the future in the, during the lifetime of the vehicles. Yeah, and then the second trend is that in all four regions, um, of course, this greenhouse gas emission benefit of battery electric vehicles will only improve for future vehicles. Next slide. Yeah, and that's a look into the far future in uh, 2050. And that's the target here. We, I mentioned on the first slide, uh, the year in which we want to have a reduction of the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of uh, global transport by 80%. And here we can see that indeed battery electric vehicles um, and also fuel cell electric vehicles powered by 100% additional renewable electricity can deliver that level of reduction um, on the life cycle basis. Um, and this means that, um, yeah, by 2050, we would need to have um, a 100% fleet um, that is uh, that corresponds to battery electric vehicles or fuel cell electric vehicles powered by renewable hydrogen. Next slide, please. Yeah, and here on this slide, you can see, uh, yeah, first, um, yeah, the difference between fuel cell electric vehicles powered by renewable electricity-based hydrogen and battery electric vehicles. And this is a difference in the um, energy demand. So driving fuel cell electric vehicles with re renewable hydrogen corresponds to a three times higher um, energy intensity uh, just because of um, yeah, inefficiencies in the um, transformation of electricity to hydrogen and then back to, to electricity in the car. And there are some energy losses corresponding to these processes. Therefore, you need three times as much renewable electricity if you want to drive a fuel cell electric vehicles. Um, but uh, when you go even further and want to produce um, electrofuels or e-fuels from renewable electricity and drive with, with these e-fuels, um, you will need uh, six times as much uh, energy to drive the same distance uh, with, with the same kind of car. Um, and due to these very high energy de demand, uh, e-fuels um, are expected to uh, are right now and also are expected to be a very expensive and also limited. Um, and uh, therefore we, we see only very limited contributions they can make uh, in road transport especially. They will be used or they will be needed 
for aviation and maybe also for shipping and uh, for uh, sectors in which it is very difficult to uh, directly use electricity and for these we need to save them um, and when it comes to yeah road transport and especially for passenger cars um, they will be yeah too costly and too um, limited to really play a role in the uh, average fuel mix next slide please yeah, and with, uh, with, with this, I want to come to my uh, final um, conclusions to the key messages. Um, so just to, to repeat, we, we see that already today, um, better electric vehicles offer a large life cycle greenhouse gas emission benefit over uh, conventional gasoline cars in Europe, in, in China, in India, and also in the US. Um, and then we see that when looking into the future, battery electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles are the only two power turn types that allow the reduction that we need um, on the on the in, 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 uh, in global road transport um, and we also see that there's no realistic pathway to decarbonize um, combustion engine vehicles as i mentioned uh, e-fuels will are expected to remain too expensive and too limited to play a significant role in road transport but we see pretty much the same for low carbon biofuels so they are biofuels um, that are based on, um, on on food like corn based um, ethanol um, and these have uh, relatively high emissions when including also the land use change emissions they uh, cause um, so they are not really uh, a solution to reduce uh, the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions but there are also low carbon biofuels that are based on, on residues or on, on wastes um, but for these we uh, see that they are also costly or also limited in availability. So uh, for passenger cars, we don't see a, a very large contribution of these kind of biofuels. So this means that um, if we want to uh, yeah, limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C, we need to have a more or less fully electric fleet by 2050. And in order to have the fleet 100% uh, electric by 2050, we need to start, uh, we need to stop actually uh, selling combustion engine cars um, like the lifetime of 15 to 18 years of these cars earlier, which would be uh, 2030 to 2035. Um, yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. And thank you, Georg, for another interesting presentation, a deep look into the climate impacts of these passenger vehicles and the different platforms. Um, with that, we'll move now into a Q&A section of the webinar. Um, remember, if you have questions, please uh, type them in the questions box to the right of your screen, and we'll answer as many as we can. We already have a couple here. So, um, uh, very first question to Chris. Um, it's actually a couple of questions, so I'll sort of put them together uh, related to battery lifetime and replacement cost. Uh, one question is simply, what can you say about that uh, based on the work that you did? And then another, not to put you too much on the spot here, but uh, for a Nissan, a 2016 Nissan Leaf in particular, have a rough idea of what it would cost to replace that battery. Maybe that would be a good example if you happen to have that at your fingertips. But... Uh, thanks, thanks, Joe. Um, re regarding battery lifetime, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people think of uh, EVs as you know the same th way you think of your uh, TV remote that every every so often you just have to take the batteries out and put put new ones in. Um, actually, automakers are working really hard to design these batteries to last as long as the vehicles. Um, in general, with an, an EV, the uh, the battery doesn't die, but it it slowly loses a little bit of capacity over time. Uh, the data so far indicates that that rate for current EVs is about two percent a year. Um, so that means if you bought an EV today that had 250 miles of range, after 10 years you can expect that same car to have about 200 miles instead of 250 miles. Um, and you know, after 15 years, maybe it's 175 miles. So 
So it's not that the battery dies and stops working. It's just that um, you know your capacity is somewhat limited. And just like gasoline cars, you know, older cars, you may not you may not take your 15 year old uh, car on your road trip. You you might take your newer car take a newer car on on that road trip. There'll be different somewhat different use cases for those older EVs, but we expect the battery for on most cars, most EVs, to last the life of the vehicle. And what, if that battery does die, like your engine dies sometimes on your car, or your transmission might go out on a 15-year-old car, that that's probably an end of life thing for that car. So that, you know, it's probably it. You know, all, most EVs today come with a eight year, 100,000 mile warranty on the battery. So if something happens before that, uh, the the automaker will replace it. But, you know, full replacement of a battery is probably unlikely for most people uh, for an EV. That's at least what we see, um, you know, I, as far as the cost for a 2016 Nissan Leaf, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> but yeah, fair enough. <clears throat> fair enough. Um, maybe uh, maybe yeah. I can also comment on that, that yeah, question sure. um, because there's some some research showing that for um, the current um, batteries that are built in, in new vehicles right now, uh, which are not on the road um, in large um, amounts already. Um, yeah, the, the results show that you can charge and discharge these batteries for more than 3,000 cycles without uh, having a reduction of the capacity by, by 20%. So um, this means that you could like run these cells for a whole vehicle life. So 3,000 cycles means with, when you have like 200 to 400 uh, kilometers range, uh, when you multiply this, you end up with more than a million um, um, kilometers you can drive with, with that car, with that battery. Uh, so it, it can even be that you can use these batteries in a second life applications after being used in a car. Uh, but that, that um, is so far, these are like lab test values. Um, it's the question how this will hold in reality. But uh, we would expect that um, what, what Chris said for uh, vehicles that are on the market right now that this will only improve in, in, in future. Thank you, Georg. Um, sort of a follow-up question then on battery center on this topic. Uh, question from one of the attendees, and I guess I'll direct it to both, both of you. But what's the environmental impact when batteries are disposed? Can you talk a little bit about that sort of end-of-life scenario? Maybe Chris, yeah. would you? Okay, okay. No, yeah, I, I, mean, I, can, I can start with a couple of thoughts. I'm sure Georg has more detailed yep. input here. But as, as Georg mentioned, that you know, a lot of these batteries are gonna they they tend to discharge, they lose capacity, but they don't die necessarily. So there's a lot of potential for second use of these batteries uh, in in stationary storage and and other uh, usages. And even once they they end at that period. Um, there's there's a huge industry spooling up to recycle these batteries because they contain so many. The mineral value in the battery is very high, so there's there's a lot of economic uh, incentive to recycle the EV batteries. Uh, recycling companies are going to want these batteries, are going to pay you for these batteries. Uh, you're not going. It's so it's more of an opportunity than a challenge, is the way I see it. Yeah, um, there's not much to add. To add. So, so um, that was perfectly right. So um, may, maybe one aspect is that, that right now in Europe, we, we have like big negotiations about a new battery directive that would uh, like mandate uh, certain recycling targets to, uh, to, to the batteries that are uh, placed in the market. And I think that that's some, something that is on, our, on the horizon also in the US. Um, so that would also be uh, even mandated by policymakers to re recycle these batteries with, with a very high recycling rate. Okay, thanks. Uh, here's a question uh, for Georg specifically. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Your plug-in hybrid column showed a lot of emissions due to gas. 
but that obviously depends on how far you drive, I guess. Is the amount that you showed an actual average? Yes. <laughs> so um, that, that, that's a good point. So for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, it really depends on how you use them. When you, you use them, you <coughs> charge them every day, maybe even twice. You charge them at home, then you drive to work, you charge them again. Uh, and you, you can really maximize the share of electric driving. Um, that, that's good, but there are also users that hardly charge these plug-in hybrid electric vehicles at all. Um, and in, on, yeah, what we considered in this study is, is the average uh, usage behavior uh, for, for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. We could see for Germany, for instance, that um, private owners of plug-in hybrid electric vehicles charge their, uh, their, their car only um, yeah, or less than uh, on three out of four driving days. Um, yeah, and this is what, what results in relatively high emissions for plug and hybrid. At least they are higher than uh, what would be considered by the official test values. Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> to, uh, another question for Chris. Um, what about charging infrastructure? Uh, yeah, yeah about great. Charging infrastructure. Great, great question. Um, you know, there, it's, it's a question that comes up when it, whenever you talk about EVs. Um, so it, there's, there's really kind of two types of EV owners, those who have the ability to uh, charge at home and, and those that don't right now. And right now, EVs are a great choice, a, an amazing choice for somebody who has a plug at home as a place that they can charge at home. For people who can charge at home with, with an EV that gets 250 miles of range, which is pretty typical of EVs on the market today, those drivers can do 92% of their driving with just plugging in at home. Really for those drivers, charging infrastructure, the only reason they need charging infrastructure is for the occasional once, twice, three times a year, when you take a longer trip, take a, take a road trip in your EV, and we need in infrastructure along all of our major highways. Uh, and a lot of that is already being, already there or already being built to where most people can take road trips, you know, lots of places. Uh, um, but there is more funding coming with the infrastructure package, $7.5 billion that hopefully will be matched by, by private sector um, partners uh, to really make sure that there's an EV charger everywhere people want to drive. And it's going to take some time, but, but people can already do most of their driving. Where get, things get challenging, and this is where we really need to continue to have policy, is for those Americans who don't have a place to charge at home and, and getting chargers um, where they park on the street at work uh, in their in their apartment building, um, and that's going to take some time um, and and time and policy to get infrastructure in place to ensure that EVs make sense for all Americans, not just Americans who have a driveway or or a, or a garage. Thank you, Chris. Um, <clears throat> another question for Georg. Um, why does your study show so much lower life cycle emissions for electric vehicles and other studies do? Yeah, um, I um, during the presentation I already uh, mentioned the uh, different methodological approach of covering the uh, improvement of the electric grid during the lifetime. That that's the main factor, and the other main factor maybe is that uh, we use more recent, more up-to-date uh, emission data for the battery production. And um, yeah, so there, there was a big shift in the, in the research in the last two or three years. So before there were only a data available that was based on the production of batteries in a lab scale or even in, in a pilot scale. And then people were estimating, okay, how um, high would the emissions be if we have a large industrial scale battery production? And turns out that they were overestimating the, uh, the emissions or the, the energy demand and thereby the emissions of producing batteries on a large scale. And since maybe two years, there are data on um, 
yeah, on, on large industrial scale battery production, yeah, the, these are much lower and therefore we show also lower uh, emissions for the battery production. But that's that's a common um, um, common understanding for for more recent studies. Thank you, Georg. Um, <clears throat> I guess one last uh, question here for Georg, and then I think we may be out of time. Um, what about the potential of biofuels? Yeah. Um, so yeah, in, uh, in simple words, there are two kinds of biofuels, the good ones and the bad ones. Um, the, the bad ones are the ones that, that are based on, um, on, on crop, on food-based uh, um, yeah, crops, so like corn ethanol, but maybe also palm oil-based biodiesel. And uh, for these kind of biofuels, there are very high emissions that correspond to the land use change. So when you um, yeah, use a field to produce these kind of, um, um, uh, of, of the fuels, you uh, need somewhere in the world, you need additional land that is used for agriculture. And in the worst case, you would have some deforestation because of that. Uh, and these emissions, when including also these emissions of additional production of, of, uh, of biofuels, um, yeah, many of these don't look better than using fossil fuels. Um, so they are not really um, a way to decarbonize uh, the road trends have been looking at the whole life cycle of greenhouse gas emissions. And the good ones, that's something I, um, I mentioned during the presentation, um, are based on residues or on wastes, um, like used cooking oil, for instance. Um, and of, of this kind of biofuels, there's just yeah, limited availability. You cannot scale up the production because there's just so and so much waste and residues that can be used. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> well, we are about out of time uh, for the question period, so maybe we can wrap this up. Uh, Chris or Georg, if you had any final thoughts that you wanted to leave us with. Okay. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Yeah, all right. Thanks, thank you. So, yeah. Thanks everyone who attended, uh, and thanks to you both for a couple of excellent, uh, very informative presentations. So as I mentioned, um, we will be posting the presentations online, uh, and the recording of this uh, webinar will also be available probably sometime early next week. So Chris Georg, thank you once again. Bye. Bye.